Welcome back to your story medicine today. I am with Luna. Luna Grace Isbell Love, who is a transformational alignment and leadership mentor with a master's degree in spiritual psychology and the creator of the Alignment Code. Also, she recently re uh, released her new deck, which is the Self-Initiation Affirmation Deck. And uh, all of this is to support her dharma of working within the intersections of the human and the holy. Her mission is to offer spaces for self-initiation to service-oriented change makers who hear the call to step more fully into aligned leadership through their unique expression and maintenance of their values so that they can run legacy, leaving lives, families, communities, and organizations. And in the past 10 years, she's assisted thousands of visionaries through one-on-one -on -one mentorships, online group programs, workshops, and transformational retreats to cultivate unshakable confidence and offer the personal contributions to a collective legacy that we can all be proud of. I've heard so many amazing things about these retreats, several of my own friends and colleagues are where they are at because of Luna's guidance. And so it is such a privilege to be sharing space with you today as we dive into initiations. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm, I'm excited for this. So I know that you just came back from an epic experience. So tell us about what you're celebrating about yourself. What am I celebrating about myself? I'm celebrating feeling my roots again. I feel like in the last three months, my my roots were up uprooted, and I am feeling them starting to like reach back down into the ground, and um, I feel a lot more like sovereign and stable and solid within myself, and that's a a nice feeling that I'm celebrating mm -hmm. and I also really you know learn to love the displacement learn to see the displacement as medicine as in service to my um, my being my growth my my path and my purpose and that's that's the hard part the the feeling rooted now is is like nice and easy it's it's the in between that is the where all the magic happens Ooh, yeah i have some things to say about that <laughs> especially as a well especially as a child of immigrants we're many of us are just like constantly searching for what is home is home here yeah. in the united states is it back over there and then what about for people who can never go back and this constant search can create that suffering versus versus celebrating that oh i landed right here in this moment in this lifetime now how is it that i can learn how to plant roots wherever it is i go so uh, yeah that piece on belonging, like like land belonging and home is such a thing that I think so many of us are troubled with, like in that, in the body, just feeling where, where do I belong? And I think so many of us are so far from that, the roots of, of land where our own ancestors' bones are buried, where we can feel that in a different way, that it that we're learning how to do that in this um, energetic and spiritual and like body is home and like, yes, all of that's great, but there's also a grief and a loss in not having that sense of place. Yeah, tell us about the initiation that you just came from. And also, also if you could take away your titles, how is it that you mm -hmm. would describe your medicine? Oh, I love that second question. I'm going to answer that first. I, it's funny. I've done a few podcasts where I've been like, I'm not sending you a bio, just like, let's just talk. Like I can't, I can't even with these bios, you know? Um, 
<laughs> and like the introduction was like, it wasn't just like, oh, here's Luna. It was like, she doesn't want this. She's sick. Like she said all the things I said in my email of like, I don't want to talk about all this like identity labels, whatever. And so like basically my my thing that I said in the email was what was shared as my introduction. So I love that you're asking me this. Strip down. I'm a woman who cares deeply. Yeah. And my care is sometimes painful to feel and also the thing that is my fuel and motivation to do every action that I that I choose yeah I like that answer a lot more than the bio (laughs) but here's the thing Um, because a lot of a lot of people who are listening though and and you experience this it's like people don't take action because because like we tend to get caught up in our heads about what is the title what is it I do which modality do I pick how do I want people to perceive me and we spent hours trying to come up with the perfect bio to uh, to to have credibility over what it is we do and what I've experienced over and over again is that that most people will not be coming to you because of that people need to know whether or not you even care do you care about me do I feel safe with you can I trust that this person can carry me through the through these initiations and if I don't trust myself and and the fires that I've walked through or even if I'm going through them, then that energy is going to transfer onto this person who's saying like, see me. Yeah. So that's, that's the, that's the medicine is caring so deeply. And even when we are going through our own rites of passage to just for a moment, put that aside or say like, I'm walking this path with you I'm in no way a a perfect fully enlightened fully initiated human being and I don't even know if there is such thing right right yeah but but for people who are aspiring to walk this path there's this story that that I have to be perfect I have it I have to have it all together yeah and here you are as an embodiment of hey Hey, I'm, I, I know life is messy. Like life shadows. is messy. Mm-hmm. Life is messy. And my work is about how to meet the waves of life's messiness with as much grace as possible. And that that's our personal responsibility and to not create more drama and more harm and more trauma through our unresolved pieces that live within us, but to take responsibility for them. And that's not always easy. We, we're a culture who likes quick fixes, you know, even just now in, in the COVID era, it's like people would much rather get a shot than like, and think that that's going to help them like exercise and stop drinking and like take care of your body and get outside in the sun and like do all the things. It's like, Oh, this is this, this like quick thing is going to protect me and I'll get free donuts instead of like, oh, I have to do this work, you know, and I'm really about the work. And I get that that's not culturally what we're into. We want the quick fix. And I'm really into the the slow growth, the journey that shapes us and how the journey itself of, of cultivating something is, is what grants us that thing that we're trying to create in in the end you can't just get it because the journey is what gives it to you um so you asked about this passage that i was recently on and i'm in and it's actually the first time i'm publicly talking about what's been going on in my life which is i've been in i'm married i've been in a relationship for six years with my partner and we're getting divorced we're separating and it's been really hard. It's been really beautiful. It's been filled with a lot of dignity and love. And I feel like the way that we're meeting it 
is setting us up both for success and whatever is next. And it's really beautiful that we can meet it this way. I bought the book Conscious Uncoupling and I started reading it and I was like, we're doing all of this stuff. Like I didn't need this book, like we're doing all of this. Um, but I recently went on a, on a wilderness journey because I was in a training with the School of Lost Borders that I did my vision quest with, uh, vision fast with many years ago, four or five years ago. And it was a women's week long wilderness training. And I felt like it was gonna be really good for me during this passage to just shut down, get off the phone and the computer and get away from my, my home where we're still cohabitating and have this space. And so many things, when you say yes to a journey like that, after the yes, so many things come up in the way that are resistance and sabotage and like flights and everything you could possibly imagine. At some point, internally or externally, the things that are blocking you from honoring the yes come up. And that was totally the case for me. But I ended up committing even more deeply and, and arriving and being like, okay, I'm, I'm committing to this. I'm going to drive from Texas to California. I'm going to go, I'm going to do this thing. The, the morning of, they call me and say, smoke fires, we have to cancel. And I'm, you know, car packed. And I say, okay, well, part of me just wanted to turn around and go home after driving 24 hours. And I, you know, found some dispersed camping in a beautiful mountain town. And I just was like, I'm going to create a base camp for a week and I'm going to be by myself in the woods as far removed from everyone as I can. And I hadn't done that in a little while. And it like, I was like, oh, I'm a young woman in the woods alone and like all the things. And I was just like, I can handle it. I've got like my, my gear and my, my stuff and I'm trained and <laughs> not how to use a knife well and like you know all the things that I'm like I'm also anyone could overpower me um and I just moved through a lot of of things that weren't me things that I adopted over the years to be in what I thought was my lifelong partnership places of myself that I had bartered with that I had said, okay, I'll trade, I'll trade this for that. And I can let go of this. I can compromise. I can, I can sacrifice this part of myself because that's what you do in relationships. You compromise. And, and I don't really think that that's true anymore. I mean, compromising on little things like I want pizza and you want sushi is a different kind of thing. Um, than minimizing authentic parts of ourself. And so I did this and I chose to go into this space by myself and I had three, four beautiful days and I, and I knew that there was like a ceremony that had to happen, but I, I couldn't like find myself in it. And then one morning I just was having tea and I just started, I got my journal and I started writing and it all came through. And it was really my personal, the, the letter was a goodbye letter to my husband. And it was in, instead of everything that we had talked about over the last three months, it was just the deep, deep, deep personal responsibility of all the ways in which I, I wish I showed up differently because the last three months have been more of like, this is what I wanted and I wasn't getting and I can't stay because I'm disappointed. And it wasn't like I didn't show up in all these ways. And I really just got to flush all of that out and be in my, in a greater place of integrity. And it's where those roots started growing. And I felt home in myself because I was embracing my integrity and walking my talk in a different way. And it felt like, oh, I'm complete. Like, this is what I came here for. And, 
and I had to drive across half the country and go through all these initiations and, um, and it was worth it. <sighs> oh, M G. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like how, what what is going on for this to be happening on a collective level we talk about collective legacy luna and it's like i i've been suffering from a vulnerability hangover ever since i released my last solo podcast episode mm -hmm. announcing to my community that i also just came out of this relationship this 10 year relationship. And this is the first episode I'm recording with, with you. It happens to be with you where I have my, my head is shaved and I'm sure people are like, wow, is that really what happened? Like she just, she pulled a Britney Spears or something like that. Like I had all of these thoughts going on in my mind as, as I was getting ready to shave my head. I'm like, people are going to think I'm crazy. It's so funny because I went through like a big breakup in 2013 and it was filled with so much grief. And that's when I shaved my head. Um, and I was like, I don't need to do that this time. It doesn't feel the same. It's like, it was like, it wasn't about that relationship so much. It was just the depth of initiation of grief. All the, the many things in my life that I had oh. lost that had not been grieved, that had not been dignified in that loss in their death. And the relationship was kind of just the catalyst that was like, are you gonna grieve now? Because you can't, you can't not. And that's when I, I shaved my head. And now I feel so much more intimate with this friend that I call grief that I was like, it doesn't feel, it's like I've been here before. So it didn't feel like I was like this big thing. It's like, oh, this really sucks. And I feel a lot of feelings and I'm so sad vulnerability hangover for the last three months, but it wasn't like, yeah. And I'm just like, oh, when I saw yesterday on Instagram with the video that you shaved your head, I was like, oh, I get it. I know where she's at. <laughs> and I treated it like a ceremony. I wore it a was, robe totally. and, totally. it, it, and, and I was witnessed by this beautiful matriarch. I can't talk about it publicly yet, but for anybody who's listening, just know that you'll get to see that as well. And I felt like I stepped more into myself and I like, I, I wouldn't have done it any other way. So it was like this, this rites of passage just fell into my lap. I was given a very short amount of time to make this decision. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is what I just talked about on my on my solo podcast episode, June, are you going to embody your medicine of letting go? Will you give yourself permission to say yes to this, trusting that when you lead from this place, the, the universe has your highest good in mind and that there are, there are portals that are opening to people, places, and opportunities that have been waiting for you to receive and yet you can only receive when you surrender and because we have lost so many of these rituals the elders who are able to hold us through these initiations it's just like so many people are going through it themselves and yet here we are, here you are recreating these kinds of spaces for people to dive into those shadows, to not just have to focus on the light, but to make the, the, the space for the grief. Grief is something that's still very new to me. And so when I see the work that you're producing now, it's that permission to say, oh, I can be the human before the healer. But what does, is that safe? Is it safe for me to grieve publicly? Or is my story going to be weaponized against me? Mm -hmm. So tell us about your ancestral lineage and how this is informing the ways that you're showing up in your medicine today. 
Oh, I love this question. My, I come from a big mixed blood, many rivers into the ocean kind of background, um, which is why your comment about place, it's a, it's a different thing because of being so mixed in so many cultures. It's like, where, where do I even, it's not like, oh, everybody comes from this one place and that's where I go and I can go travel and visit there and it feels like home. Um, my, my ancestry is very mixed and I, how do I want to talk about this? My European descended ancestry, I've come to see how much of the issues that we have in America are from the lack of space for the European people to grieve their loss of culture and in their loss of culture and survival and kind of, um, I can't think of the word that I want to use, but like kind of amalgamation, like coming together as one, one culture when it's so not, uh, and losing so much in, in language and in indigeneity and tradition and culture and not simply having the space to grieve because of survival and then passing that lack of grief literacy, not literacy, because I think that they knew how at that time. It's just that in order to survive there, you had to adapt very quickly and adopt this new culture in order to survive. And so I think as that has been passed down through generations and then those generations um, colonizing other places, it's like that pain of, oh, now, now like, now you're experiencing the same thing in a subconscious way, almost like trying to create belonging through like trauma bonding. So creating all these uh, like, the genocide of indigenous people on Turtle Island and slavery um, as a way of almost subconsciously being like, I think so many of the European people who were participating in that had no idea that that generational grief was even inside of them. But I believe that those actions subconsciously came from that place of trying to experience belonging in that loss of culture and loss of identity that now there's like a real place of relationship but who wants to relate with someone who's creating that and so I find that that the reclamation of grief as an inherent part of our life death is something that's such an integral part that we have avoided in this very youth centric um, searching for the fountain of youth culture that does not want to look at things, look at death, look at how prevalent it really is and how its prevalence is begging us and beckoning us to become intimate with it in order for, I really believe that our life is simply a preparation for that final act. And that final act has a potential for so much freedom or suffering. And that the way that we live our life is really going to determine so much of our preparedness to really fully let go or not at that moment. And that's what I'm really interested in is people who are willing to use their life as a preparation for their death and knowing that those things are happening simultaneously. I use life death as a hyphenated singular unit, life hyphen death as one thing that it's not like, oh, our whole life. And then there's the moment of our death. No, they're happening simultaneously throughout our entire existence. And I'm just really turned on by the reclamation of that as our 
inherent way of being and that we culturally are living that way and passing the awareness of that on to future generations because I think it evokes a lot of personal responsibility and leadership, which is what I'm, which is what I feel like we desperately need. But is this something that was passed down to you? No, okay, great. So yeah. Okay. So just like, <laughs> no, looping back in that, like that European lineage, it's like, no, I, my mom died when I was 13 and a, my grandma was the only one who really grieved and cried. And everyone was like, oh, she's so much to be around. Like, it's like, come on, like Nana, like, like almost like not wanting to be with her because it was so intense. And I was, you know, raised in the best way that they knew how to be like, this is life, which it is, right? But I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like, this is life. Like, yes, feel this, this is life. It was like, this is life. And you got to kind of like, tough enough and move on and like shit happens, you know, and it sucks. And I'm sorry, this is happening to you. And like, it'll make you tougher and you'll get through it. So I really adopted not feeling. And I was 13 and I spent a good decade to 15 years avoiding my feelings and becoming an addict and numbing and an addict in so many ways you name that addiction and I was probably using it in, in some way. Um, and I really numbed and nobody noticed. And I think all of my numbing was simply like seeking for someone to notice. Like if I, if I bring myself further down into this hole of desperation and like a bad life, <laughs> will someone come, will someone notice? Like, I just wanted the people to come together, the community, my family, whatever it was that I was subconsciously longing for. And I also see the addict archetype as like the mystic, the one who like knows there's something more in life and who's searching for it in all these misaligned places, but like deeply knows like, this is not it. Like there's something more and searching for that high just to get a taste of what that moreness of life really is just that like depth of feeling so much just even though it's numbing in so many other ways just to get like ah yes that's really it but just in a misaligned way and so it definitely wasn't passed on to me I come from both sides of my family really not having a lot of emotional equippedness to confidently take it on and in totally different ways one that's avoidant and one that's kind of like yeah this is life shit happens and like you just kind of go through it so I really had to learn how to welcome this and re-engage in life in a different way in my adult years as I got sober and I and all the things that I had avoided started flooding back and that's what made me see how valuable it is to live that way and I've had the I've had my feet in both places of a dissociative life and a really deeply feeling life and a kind of in the middle muggle kind of medium way and I so value the depth of feeling it is not easy I don't always love being there and in the long run it feels like the most useful way of relating because and I'm nourished by it even though it can feel hard, I am so deeply filled by my willingness to go to those depths. And so it's something that I more and more see in working with people, how, how much the longing for that is there, but the willingness to welcome it and receive it and or make changes that allow ourselves to receive it isn't there. And it's that like quick fix. Like I want life to be like this, but I don't wanna do anything to help myself welcome it or receive it or move the obstacles that I've placed in its way and so that's kind of become my work because I did it internally hmm. <sighs> yeah those of us who have become very skilled at dissociating are the ones who have the capacity the greatest capacity to feel 
so deeply to the point where it it hurts it can be so overwhelming and yeah yeah and i'm i'm just i'm reflecting on how how much grief has been beaten out of us have you read the book the smell of rain on dust okay yeah so you know exactly yeah i love martin Brechtel. totally i i just completing that book and it and it talks about the colonization of grief and how one of the stories is somebody uh sh showed up to their parents funeral just like sobbing so wailing so loudly allowing the grief to just be felt by everyone around them and the next thing you know an ambulance shows up and he asks who's the ambulance for and the rest of the family is like oh it's for you like we thought that there's something wrong with you and so we have this big stigma around grief and and simultaneously it's like oh what are we ever done grieving you know it's like i yes i shaved my head i was feeling so liberated and then just last night i had a little moment i had this moment of like oh oh my gosh grief is hitting me and then I wake up and I'm like, okay, I'm a warrior. I'm better. I could do this. You know, and, and, and in my, what, what I've learned in my spiritual practice that I've only learned through observation more than my parents actually passing these teachings down to me is that in, in Buddhism in Thailand, when somebody dies, the youngest shaves their head. My mom almost became an ancestor like two months ago that was the same and when she announced to me when she texted me three days before I was supposed to leave for Hawaii and said I might not make it this week that was also the day that I ended my relationship that day happened to also be mercury in retrograde and so it was like every like when when it rains it pours and and so I'm, I've been That's asking grief. myself. Like Ooh. when it rains, it pours. It's like I was saying before, not to cut you off, but like, yeah, it's yeah. that, it's that sense of like, it's not just the one thing that we're grieving, like your relationship. Mm. It's all the other grief that hasn't been acknowledged along the way, losing a job, losing a house, another relationship that you kind of just met somebody else and didn't really grieve it. It's like when, it, when it rains, it pours because it's almost so, um, backed up like on on deck waiting to come forward that when you let it come forward it's all the other grief that hasn't come forward you and i are in the business of <laughs> we are in the business of embodying our medicine it's totally. like totally <laughs> so you signed like, up for it's what you well and then there's this there's this like and when i first entered this realm when i first stepped into business i know that the thing that held me back the most was this fear of oh they're gonna find out that i i'm a total fraud they're gonna know that i don't have my life together who is going to want to listen to me when I feel like I'm constantly going through these initiations and yet here here we both are grieving the transition of of a relationship that we both I, I don't, I don't even want to know if I, I like it to say fantasize, but we both had intentions of spending the rest of our lives with somebody else where we could grow up to be elders, where you can like, you know, have a family where we can cultivate a loving home, everything that checks off the box of, I guess what they call like the relationship escalator, court, get married, have kids, uh, retire, travel the world, whatever. Get a is. dog, um, buy a house. A do <laughs> Your dog is hella cute, by the way. I know. <laughs> and you 
did those things. And then I just been like, oh my God, I'm in my thirties and I feel like I'm going through a rebirth. And how, how interesting is it that this program you're creating next is called resurrection because I've been reflecting a lot on how I have just transitioned out of my Jesus year. We have our Saturn. So you're 34 returns. now. I'm 34 now. So we have our Saturn return between 29 to 27 to 32 ish. And then my Jesus year was my best year. It was the year that I went through a pandemic. It was a year where my business hit over six figures. It was the year where I finally felt like everything I had worked for was just like the, the, the sapling was starting to show itself from the seeds that were planted during my Saturn return. Jesus year happens. The week of my 34th birthday, right before I turned 34, is when everything felt like it was crumbling and it and it felt like I was going 10 step backwards. Yet, because of the work, because of the embodiment, I can say, oh, okay, this is a part of walking through the fires. June, how is it that you, like, what is the story you will tell of how you came through this? So tell us about resurrection. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's a lot of things combined of like one, my programs just come through. Like sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I just write it all down. And then I wake up and it's like the whole curriculum or like everything. And that's kind of what happens and I trust it. There's also, there's a woman in my community who I've, I've never really like resonated with. And I, I've, you know, just gotten to know her in the last six months of moving and, and the Instagram is just like all love and light all. And I was like, Oh, this is why I never got the good vibes. Like, this is why I didn't <laughs> trust you. Um, and I could see how my life trajectory was in last year with COVID, I did what I was really good at to help my community, which was branding and storytelling and messaging and graphics and, and business and online. It's like, I'm really good at that but that's not really why I'm here. And my business boomed because people want that. But there's so many people who came to me who was like, you could do this, but like you haven't grieved this thing. So you want to step into this business, but like at some point, this stuff that is untended is going to come up. And so even though it was still it was rebranded in a way that was sacred business, spiritual alignment, leadership, re personal responsibility. It was still in alignment for me. It's not really what I'm here to do. And it just felt so liberating to reclaim my role as a threshold tender and a rite of passage in a public, not public, but like rebranding kind of way after, after rebranding my whole business to be more of a business coach. And I was like, that's, that was fun. I tried that on. Thanks. Um, this was helpful. And part of the reason for doing that was this idea that like, nobody wants to do hard work. And I've done so many programs that like, don't really do that well, but I could, you know, market and sell something like this. And it does so well. And like, it's really just the packaging. And at the end of the day, we're still doing the same type of work because it's me. I can't help it. But I, resurrection just came through and it was like, this is what the collective needs at this time. And I have to be honest about it. And I'm not gonna tell you that at the end of this journey, you're gonna feel, you're gonna feel like your life is in order. You might have to make the hardest decision ever because you finally got honest with yourself. And I would rather have you be honest and liberated than living a lie and bound to that lie. So if that means you need to get divorced, break, you know, quit your job, move, go live with your parents, whatever it is, I can't promise you, like, 
all the Shake online. Pro- <laughs> yeah, all the online programs are out there. Are like you're gonna feel great. This program's gonna give you this and it's ten figures and blah 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 blah. <laughs> ten figures, six figures, whatever it is. And I'm and I'm just like, yes. And that's not the reality. And I'm so tired of. I don't really feel like I've been dishonest, but like participating in that narrative when the narrative that I'm personally attracted to is the Martine Prechtel, the Stephen Jenkinses, the people who are being really honest about what's really going on in our culture and to stop pretending that like you're making six figures is going to help you if you're fucking lying to yourself about who you are. And Mm. I believe I have found in that liberation that everything else aligns itself. And so my attempt in this is to be really honest is to in, I feel like I'm putting words. Like if you, I know you've gone through the sales page, the landing page, but I feel like it's just the inner voice that we all have. It's not necessarily like Luna's marketing voice. (laughs) It's, It's like, no, this is the inner calling that all of us hear and have pushed away in a lot of ways. And if the people who are longing to not push it away anymore, don't feel like there's another option or are tired or just like, yeah, this is my first go at grief and I don't even know where to begin and it's uncomfortable and I think it's over and another wave just knocks me down. I've been through those passageways so many times intentionally and unintentionally that I feel like I am home and familiar and I have been guiding people into that underworld not because I'm I'm infatuated with the darkness or the suffering but because I know it leads to such greater light and expansion and a sense of being in our fullness because we've we've created more space within that lower realm. And I'm, I feel like it's the thing that our culture has been avoiding. And so as a leader, as a legacy leader, to me, it feels so much more congruent of what our culture is seeking and longing and begging for that I can see in our actions and see in our behaviors that we're really longing for. So it would be a disservice to not use my experience in the underland as a guiding force for those who really need to do that work so that they can leave their bigger legacy because so much of the untended grief is what stands in the way of our own expansion and that's why I work with people who identify as leaders because I I want someone who's like I'm not just doing this work for me I'm doing this work to help our collective and that's you know, I'm doing that in my way. And I want to welcome people who feel like they're doing that in their way, because it's none of this work is really about just us. It's about all of us. (sighs) Yes. Yes. And one of the things that you emphasize is that I'm not here to save you. And I think there's I, you know, even for myself, because I, I talk, I talk to my community about how there's, we're, we're motivated by two things. There's, there's pain and there's pleasure. And while I'm constantly emphasizing the need to be more in our pleasure, to embody that pleasure, we also can't bypass the pain that our capacity to experience that joy and pleasure in our lives is going to be a reflection of how deep we're willing to go also into those shadow parts. So how is it that you can talk about And can about we that? make that pleasurable? Ooh, yes. How is it that we can make grief a pleasurable experience? In my experience, it's not necessarily the wave of grief that feels pleasurable, but mm-hmm. it's my personal acknowledgement of my own willingness to go there that brings me joy. Like when I'm like, wow, look at you meeting this. Like, wow, look at your, your strength, your willingness, your ability, your, you're not hiding anymore. You're not avoiding this thing that you have in the past. Like that's where my joy comes from. It's not necessarily in the moment of, of like deeply being with 
pain and it is because there is this there is this permission slip that I'm giving myself that feels so, like something to celebrate. Mm-hmm. And that's where I, I can, you know, one of the things is like, okay, we've all been there. We've all been in our own way to, to the underworld and got knocked down. And most of us kind of just life pushed us through it and we survived. But this program is really about, can you go willingly? Can you go intentionally? Can you choose to look at these things instead of being forced to? Can you willingly do the necessary work in or, and not because life says you have to, but because you want to support your expansion? And can you, can you find ecstasy in that place? And I think about Alice in Wonderland, which was originally called Alice in Underland. Ooh which is the underworld and that she falls down the rabbit hole and she's in the underworld and she's going through all these initiations to find who she is and all these symbols of her own subconscious, which is just the oldest myth and on journey re it's Alice in Wonderland is just a version of that. And it's everything that we go through and it's the myth that Joseph Campbell talked about and it's reflected everywhere in nature and seasons and the day and the sun, it's everywhere. And so to deny ourselves that experience is to deny our own inherent nature. Literally nature is constantly reflecting this same thing. And if we can buy into the illusion that somehow the sun is always shining, it's we're, we're, we're living a lie inside of ourselves and that lie will eventually catch up with us. And we will have to go, oh, it's really nighttime and and I'm scared here. And I want to learn how to be with this because I don't want to feel scared. And I want to help my kids when they're older or the people in my community that I'm an elder to when I'm older to meet these things. And I can't help them do that if I haven't even done that myself. And I'm still afraid to go there and I'm aging and I'm still afraid to die. That's the thing. We say we want to be able to help others. We say we want to create these kinds of sacred spaces. We want to be healers within our communities and yet are we willing to go through some of these very initiations that we may be potentially holding space for others to walk through. And of course, everybody has their own journey. I've been saying that to my own students. I'm like, hey, what worked for me may or may not work for you, but I will be here by your side as you go through your own fires like we are elders in the making are you willing to 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 like face not not just focus on the love and the light right but face those shadows and find the medicine within that so tell us about some of the i don't know if i want to call them like initiations or some of the portals that you're going to be walking people through like who is this for this, this is the first time is, I'm hearing about Alice in Underworld, by the way, I and know. Inanna's journey. So I'm like, I'm like, ooh, the little kid in me who is into mythology is mm-hmm. so activated right now. This is for three people. This is for the people who have been avoiding the that call from their own underworld that's been beckoning them forth that hear it and want to go but don't know how or have been avoiding it and know it's time but don't really feel confident in doing that on their own. This is for those who are in a place of of grief who really just wanna reclaim a guide, a community, oh, we're supposed to do this together. Like, I don't have to do it alone. And maybe you've done it before, but you're in it right now. That's the second person who it's for. It's just like, the person who's been avoiding probably doesn't feel like they're in it, but they they hear the call. The second person is like, I'm in it. And like, oh, I don't have to do it alone. And there's someone who's been here lots of times who wants to guide me. Amazing. And when I say guide, I don't mean like, here's your map and like, take a left turn. It's guiding you into your own knowing, guiding you into your own confidence to to navigate your 
inner world, which is often our underworld, is the is really our inner world. And the third person that it's for is for leaders who are supporting others who want to expand their capacity to be with, who aren't necessarily in their own grief, but who are just seeking like, oh, shit's happening in the world. And I want to prepare myself to meet the big initiations that life might have for us as a culture and as a society, as a humanity, as organisms, animals on the planet that might be extinct and might be meeting some big things in the in the upcoming years. I want to expand my capacity to be able to meet those things. And I could I could use some support like expanding and fine tuning. And I've done so many things and like most often like this isn't the trainings that are being offered. And so it's for the people who want to expand their capacity, who are in grief, who have been avoiding grief, who know that it's time, who somehow hear inside of themselves, like that call is time. Yeah. And the portals of initiation are really, there aren't, I mean, we're moving through, we're moving through the hero heroine's journey in, in its own way. And so each person is going to find resistance or a threshold to move through in a different place and the things that come up that are our blocks or are have been standing in our way are going to be unique for each person the practice that we're meeting is the creating ritual space to meet those things really talking about what it means to walk through a threshold, what it means to be self-initiated and not just talk about them, have experiential learning and cultivate qualities of embodiment. So embodiment as a non-intellectual but somatic experience that we can step into is a big part of what it's about and using the community to have reflection and being able to see ourselves being able to see what it is that's that we're being asked to step into at this time and to to use it to strengthen ourselves and to use the the communal space as a as a mirror to support ourselves and to and you know what you said about the cultural piece with Thailand is like most places have rituals that are allowing death to be an inherent part of life and the West is one of the places that has really lost that. And so this is really a space of reclamation to remember maybe not necessarily our inherent indigenous or cultural ways to your tradition that could be part of your journey if you choose to embrace that, but, but to create new ones and to create ones that feel aligned for who we are now and to use ritual to give these things meaning because I think so much of us are trying to quickly move past them mm -hmm. so that we can get back to work and we can do our thing and we can look like we're normal in society because nobody wants to see a crying person at the supermarket and really you can't go to the supermarket without crying and so um you don't know when those when that next wave of great grief is going to hit you and sometimes and to really normalize that and ritual creates meaning and so this is a way to give the things that are happening in your life more meaning so that they make more of an impact so that they kind of are impressed into your bones and cells so that you are carrying those experiences forward with you so that the next time one of those initiations comes, you have that memory of how to meet it already impressed upon you that you know, you feel confident. You're like, oh, this again? I've been here, I got this. And that's what I wanna see from us as a, as a culture is to not go, ah, oh, I'm 50 and my parents are dying and I've never had loss and I have no idea how to meet it. It's like, you've actually had so much loss. And, and we can meet it all along the way so that we're prepared for the big stuff. And I have a feeling big stuff is coming. Mm. Mm. Yes, because the grief that we think we're experiencing in isolation is actually like what 
<laughs> so many of us are experiencing it. How can you not with everything that's happening in the world, right? How can you not? And even though I don't post about every worldly issue that's happening, it's like, I feel it. And, and, and I'm actually like, I'm, I'm frozen over what to say because the grief can feel so overwhelming. And, and it's like, oh, we don't always want to put our grief on display. And yet, where is it that you are allowing your body, your mind, and your spirit to, to move through it, to process it so that it doesn't turn into other things as you become an elder, right? Because if the journey that we are walking through is is becoming is becoming elders we're elders in the making and also as elders getting ready to transition back into the ancestral realm going back home what are we committing to not taking with us what are we committing to not passing down you can have the business you can have the branding you can have the medicine you can have your your practices that bring you back into the light but can you go there without meeting those shadows, without visiting the underworld? Because even that place is, is eventually going to be unavoidable. But will you be held in that container as you go through it, right? Or just tell yourself the story that there's something wrong with you and I don't want to be seen as weak, therefore um, I'm just going to keep this to myself. Like, no, let's not pass that on, even if you choose to not have children. You, you are in relationship with people, we, whether or not you're in business either, right? Everything comes back to relationships. Yep. Yeah, and, and our relationship with grief and death and ourselves and our thoughts and our avoidances, like that's where intimacy is being invited. And culturally, personally, we're all just longing for more intimacy. And it's also the thing that we're so deeply afraid of. And if we can't be intimate with our own aspects of ourselves that we've hidden in the shadows, how can we even meet humanity at this time that is mm. um, at this place of imbalance with, how can we even do what's necessary to, he to work towards healing humanity? in our role on this planet, if we can't even look at our own stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I think for me, it's really about like, who do you trust? Like who makes you feel safe and trustworthy? And to, like I was saying about that woman in my community, it's like, I never really felt like I could trust her. And then once I like, found her work I was like oh I this is why for me this is why I don't trust her and or I don't feel not that I don't trust her I don't feel trust in my body right yeah. like I can like lean into this relationship and be safe as a friend because there's no depth of I feel like you've been there I feel like you're willing to go there. I feel like you've been there. And to me, that's what, that's what is the people that I look up to. That's the thing that I feel from them is like, you've been through it and you're willing and you've been through it again and again. And your willingness has made you this elder that I feel like I can lean into and trust and be held by. And that you're going to, you're going to support the work that needs to happen. And that's my work in this yeah. little 35 year old body. I'm writing a book and it's all about like growing up, maturity, like self-responsibility. It's like, how do I, how do I make something like this a bestseller when like everyone is in Peter Pan syndrome? And it's like, how do I make maturity and self-responsibility sexy, right? That's the yeah. goal for me. It's like making it, tapping into that voice inside of us that's like, the thing that we all long for so that we can acknowledge like, oh yeah, there's part of me that really deeply wants to be intimate with myself so that I can experience intimacy with others so that I can live in this place of 
feeling fulfilled and satisfied because all I'm deeply longing to feel fulfilled and satisfied is this depth of intimacy that I've held myself from. And just to kind of move past that and welcome, welcome the thing that can feel really scary. Mm -hmm. The body doesn't know the difference between fear and excitement, mm -hmm. right? It's just the breath. So just, it just comes back to the breath. So as you were going through your own grieving process and which I allow you, the, the ways when my experience of you is that like, you're moving through it like water. You're like, I've been here. You know, I'm like, I wish, I wish my separation could feel like that, but it does not. I hope you don't have a next one. I don't hope you don't have a next one, but whatever that next loss is, you will because of how you're going to, how you're doing this one. It's like, this is yeah. your, this is your learning ground and you're not avoiding the learning. Yeah. So the next well, one, I mean, you'll be like, I got this. And there it are times two. when I don't have it at all. Yeah. I mean, it takes two. It's like, we want to be able to do this conscious uncoupling thing, but without both parties actually willing to move through this together in that way, then it's like, I just have to be compassionate and recognize in, in meeting, meeting my for former partner where, where he's at. And then also reflecting on how is it that I don't repeat whatever patterns I was carrying into the next mm -hmm. one? And also part of me shaving my head was my commitment to, to me, my commitment to moving through grief. And like you were saying, just like not run to the next thing because I became overwhelmed with the options of, like downloading dating apps and then suddenly being like, wow, I am not worthy. This is too fast. These questions that I'm being asked to fill out or the, even the answers, the answers to the questions that, uh, that potential partners are, are, are filling out. This is not hit the depth of, of any individual. I can't do this right now. I'm still meeting the depths of myself. <laughs> and and how how is it that you are staying grounded as you are going through your own uncoupling process your own transitions while still being able to show up in your business yeah better than I thought I mean, it's the relationship. It's like, I, we just moved. We just bought a house. Like all the things that I yeah. thought, I, I thought I'd be a mom by now. Like all these things that are like, oh, wow. Right. So many layers of grief. And in the past, how I've come to know grief is like, oh, I'm not like, yes, we're sad. We have memories of, of that bring up sadness of people that we're lo losing, but grief is really about our own identity. Mm -hmm. Who am I without this person? Who am I without this home, without being a mom? Who am I without this being married to this person? What does it mean about me? That's what grief is really inviting us to figure out and, and discover is who am I without this home, this job, this parent, this part, like whatever the thing is that you lost. And I, you know, I've done so much of that question asking for myself that I feel like I know myself and it's just the next layer. And it's like, I'm, I'm enjoying finding more layers of myself. I'm finding joy in it. And the thing that is hard for me is about self. The, the place where I find myself where it's difficult is when I forget self-parenting and I'm in my child yeah. self and I'm just like, if I cry hard enough, will someone come pick me up and save me? Ooh. Like, is anybody coming? Does any, like, I don't consciously think that, but I can feel that's where it's coming from. And it happened a few times over the few months where I went into that place and I, and I had the voice that was like, yeah, you like pick yourself up, hold yourself, choose yourself. And that's been my mantra is like, I'm choosing myself. I'm choosing myself. I'm choosing myself because the pain that I find is feeling it's not that I'm not being chosen because this is like a mutual 
thing, but, but in a way it's like, yeah, it's, not being chosen in like not having him come in the room when I'm hysterical and and like take care of me and because he's taking care of himself you know and and that's the self-parenting piece is has and showing up for myself and picking myself up off the floor when like a not a temper tantrum but like the the pain it's like I know the difference between crying because I will feel like I want to be saved and crying because it's emotion moving through me and it's my responsibility to move myself from one place to the other if that's if I see that I'm in that place of wanting to be saved because I'm an adult I'm responsible for myself no one's coming and even if they did I'm creating this and it's not like I don't deserve to have my friends or family show up for me they are they are but in those moments, it's just me and me and me and showing up for myself creates that sense of integration and wholeness and merging those aspects of myself that have felt so separate that are the ones crying because they felt so separate. And that's my, that's my job. That's my job more than my business, more than my work. My job is to make sure the parts of myself that have felt separate don't feel separate anymore, that they have a place to be welcomed into. And that's the whole of who I am. That's my, that's myself. I'm welcoming them back. And that's the thing that remembering that when I, cause I forget, but in the moment of forgetfulness, that remembrance of my, my job and my joy to welcome those parts of myself home comes when that comes up, it's like, oh yeah, that's what we're doing here. And I reorient to like, this is forging me. This is, this is shaping me in, in the ways that I ask for, that I long for. And isn't this beautiful? Thank you. And just knowing as hard as it is, it's the right thing to do. And it's, I've, you know, I see people in relationships all the time that don't, that are unhappy and don't leave. And it's like, I'm not willing to live that way and I was Mm. and all of a sudden being fine was no longer fine because there were so many good things being fine was okay and then I was like that's actually not okay for me anymore and it's the hardest thing to do because we could have stayed in that fineness for a long time but the liberation that comes from it as as like gut-wrenching and as it is Mm -hmm. is so worth it oh Yeah. Yeah. And what is it that you've been learning to release in this process? Release. I don't know. I think I relate to releasing more as integrating versus like a getting rid of. Not that that's how you're saying it. Yeah. Yeah but integrating the parts of myself that feel the need for there to be someone to blame for my pain. Mm. Ooh, and that part right there. And we all do it and we're conditioned to do it. Right. Yeah. And, and, but like, for me, it's like conditioning. I, I don't care. Yeah. Right. Like it's not an excuse. Yeah. Patriarchy, conditioning, colonial, it's not an excuse. I'm an adult and it's my responsibility to be a better human and blaming people for my pain is not being my best human self, no matter how much I've been conditioned to do that. So that's my job. And that's a, that's a big one. And it's, you know, when something doesn't feel right, it's easy to go, who, who put this there? (laughs) Right. (laughs) And and that's, that's one that I'm, I'm really enjoying integrating into myself and mm-hmm. reincorporating into the wholeness of who I am because I, you know, I do a lot of parts work in my work, a lot of uh, internal family systems and parts work and gestalt yeah. and looking at like aspects of self. And so the one who blame, the one who feels the need to blame, like what's really there? What's underneath? What do you really want? What do you, what do you, what's your intention? What are you trying to help me with? And underneath is, is like so much love, 
that I don't want to release them and push them away. I want to help them find their purpose, that part of myself. And I'm still exploring the whole of what that is, but it's That's so big. It's really about the child. It's about the learned helplessness. And, and that's not something that I like, though I embody at times. And so my job is to learn how to be compassionate with that part of myself. And through my compassion, like give it a place to know that it's welcome. And it's not like ugh, the one who blames and like reject it and release it and try to like, get rid of it. It's like, hey, like there's something deeper here and and like you have a place to to come and it's it's in the whole of myself welcome back home yeah yeah so so big and and i want to just really celebrate that that the ways that you are showing up the ways that you are moving through these initiations is because of your commitment to liberation, to your own healing, to your own sovereignty. And just even in this time alone, I feel like I've been able to receive so much of that medicine just by you embodying this, which for me, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like for people who choose to say yes to resurrection. Like imagine when you are being met with those moments that you are you, that, that your body is going to remember what it is you moved through because you had a community container to hold you through a lot of the stuff that's coming up without feeling without just allowing shame to be the story right that there is there is a beautiful medicine underneath this experience but will you allow yeah. yourself to experience it I love what you just shared because I think that a lot of the avoidance of grief is that we feel like a burden on our family and friends and society that our authentic emotions of grief or sadness is, is somehow burdening others, um, that they're going to be uncomfortable and that we have to like placate to them. And to me, it's all about intimacy. And so am I giving people that I'm relating with the opportunity to have an intimate experience or am I am I taking intimacy off the table because I'm pretending that I'm Ooh. I feel different than I am because that's actually a disservice to both of us to, to them and me and we miss this amazing opportunity that we have to to feel the nourishment of intimacy mm-hmm. even though we might have to move through some discomfort inside of ourselves to get there and for some people that I might relate with they might go you know what, that's, I'm not ready to move through that discomfort. That's not for me right now. Like have fun. It does feel like a burden to me. I'm not available. And it's like, great, but at least I'm in intimacy with myself. I'm having self-intimacy. I'm not pretending that I'm okay. Like not okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. But like that I'm, oh yeah, everything's fine. Like that shit is so boring. No one is going to have a good relationship with you if everything is fucking fine all the time. Because the truth is it's not. Yeah. Okay. So when does, when do the portals open to resurrection? We start on the eve of the autumnal equinox, which is September 20th, Monday we start. And so, you know, registration will be open till like that yeah. weekend. Um, yeah. And is- it's, it's, it's exci- I'm like, I have, I'm letting go of the story that nobody wants to do deep work because <laughs> I want to do deep work. Mm-hmm. I know you want I to do deep do. work. Hell and yeah, I, and I like that story has been really limiting the the fullness of what I've offered. And I'm ready. That's something I'm releasing. <laughs> yes. um, it's just that story because I know that there's so many people listening who are like, it speaks to something in their bones and inside of them that we all hear and all know that is true. It's it's an undeniable truth that this that loss is seeking to be acknowledged and dignified 
especially with the the portal that we are moving through the fall october november meeting with death and our ancestors and so what better time to do this than now i'm definitely i'm definitely an ideal person to be in this space and so as we are planting the seeds for us to become wise elders and future ancestors i'd love to well first of all if anybody's feeling called to join resurrection i'll go ahead and put the link in the show notes for you or you can also and you can also go up to, to luna's page what's your page luna my website is lunaloveleadership.com and it's just forward slash resurrection you can find it on instagram which is luna love leadership it's all all the places yes and and because we we barely scratched the surface of Luna, by the way, because you have yet to see the <laughs> bomb ass affirmation decks that were released. And then I'm just hearing about this book right now. But again, it's like you have the product, you have the services. We 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 have our businesses, and yet our businesses are really the playground to do this deeper work mm -hmm. alongside those who are ready to to walk through the fires to be held to no longer do it in isolation and to like really commit to becoming good elders good ancestors so if you could speak to yourself as a future ancestor looking back on these initiations you are moving through what is it that your wise future badass elder and ancestor in the making self would say to present day. Mm. <laughs> the thing I heard in my head was like, you a badass bitch. Like, yes, you are. <laughs> my ancestors are funny. Um, myself as an ancestor rather. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like there's just a lot of pride and yeah, pride, pride that I am one of the ones in my lineage who is disrupting the unhealthy patterns that have been passed down and just like celebrate yeah I'm celebrating myself as my my elder and my ancestor looking back and seeing seeing myself it's just there's a lot of like there's a lot of pride and appreciation and celebration in the background of doing doing what's necessary yeah Ooh, we're gonna be cackling I know. Ancestral realm and everything I know. that our younger selves are going through, like, <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah, yep, I remember that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't worry, it's all, it's all a part of the journey. This is a chapter in your book yep. that will be, that, that will be read by the next generation to where you will be placed at the altar of those mm. who are seeking refuge and they will say, I'm gonna make this one proud. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank mm. you so much, Luna. Goosebumps. For, Thank you. For choosing to do this work and just for, for embodying it. And it's just, it's, it's like, it's a sweet exhale for me to also know that, wow, I'm, I'm not going through this alone either. And if mm -hmm. I feel, I am feeling this way, I'm just thinking of y'all, everybody who's listening, like, like this is why we're here, right? To do this work together. So ah, thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for uh, for just like planting the seeds for the for the elders we are becoming and for allowing us to meet that grief and that death with so much life and so much grace and anybody who is held in your container uh anybody who i know of who has gone through your container i have seen massive massive transformations in their life so i'm excited for anybody who's also going through resurrection with you 
Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and to your beautiful community who's tuning in and listening. It's such an honor to be here with you. And I just, I've always enjoyed every conversation we've had. So I look forward to many more.